We're going to get right into the Word today. I don't have any announcements, no preliminaries, anything like that. We're going to get into it. Um, And I think the only thing that I need to uh, remind everybody of is, um, well, I don't think we have any announcements, so we're just going to get right into it. Last week, we spoke about um, Jesus the Lamb. Now, if you were not here, real quick and in a hurry, what we spoke about last week was that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, and if he was perfect, then through his blood, we're perfected, all right? So then we talked about that he was, uh, not only was he perfect, he was the sacrifice, and because he was sacrificed, you don't have to sacrifice yourself, amen? And we also talked about because he was punished and destroyed because of his blood, we don't have to be punished and destroyed, amen? Amen? All right, so let's get into this. We want to talk about it. We want, I, want to, I want to move from what Jesus was as the lamb over into what Jesus was as his image. He is the image of God. Amen? All right, so let's do this. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm going to read this from the NIV today. But Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 1. It says that in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Verse 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, say all things, and through whom he also made the universe. Verse 3, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact Listen now, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. Now, the Amplified says that same text that in verse 3, Jesus is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being uh, 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 the outraying or radiance of the divine person. He perf- he's the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature, maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power that he had offered himself. He had by offering himself accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt. The cleansing of sin and riddance of guilt. Are you hearing me? Riddance of guilt. We spent a lot of time on that last week. And what we've done is we've put ourselves in a place where we will accept that Jesus has forgiven us for that moment. Amen? But then we get stuck over into guilt or we get stuck over into shame. We get stuck over into letting ourselves be lied to about something that, that Jesus took. And, and I've developed a saying that I just kind of live by. We've got to give Jesus what he paid for. And if he paid for my guilt, I'm ready for him to have it. Amen. He went to the cross to take it there for you. Your job is not to pull it off the cross or remind yourself of your failure. You're all going to mess up. Oh, y'all perfect. Okay. Everybody in here is perfect. I guess I'm the only one. We all going to mess up. We're all going to put ourselves in situations where we're not living right. But what we got to see is that it's not an issue of behavior. I've been on this now for several months. We, we tend to think that behavior is what keeps us holy. It's not your behavior that keeps you holy. It's your acceptance of him and your movement toward him that keeps you holy. And the closer you get to him, the more your behavior begins to change. The worst thing that you can do is try to change your behavior. Behavior modification is not Christianity. You were born this way, but listen to me. Everybody says, well, I was born with a bad attitude. Most of us were. Well, I was born this way. I've, I've got this issue. I was born like this. and Well, it's just, it's in my family. You know, I was born with this in my blood. I was just born. I was just born. I was born with a victim mentality. My, my, my mama was this way, so I'm this way. I, me personally, we were talking this earlier today about the way I dressed. And, you know, my father, and I didn't know he died when I was 12, but he, he dressed, he was half Cherokee, and he dressed pretty flashy. And I didn't realize that, that all the suits I was buying when I first got saved was just like what my daddy would buy because it was in me. And we lean on that. We say, this is who I am. However, when you accept Jesus, you become born again. So this whole lie of, well, I was born this way, and Jesus is just going to have to, he fixed it on the cross. It was all put there at one time. And your job in Romans 8 talks about the suffering of the mind is to get to where your thought process becomes different. Suffering, Jesus doesn't need you to suffer for him. He suffered for you. 
This is not the great trade-off of how awful you can be. That what it is, is Jesus is trying to get you to understand that he took your suffering, he took your guilt, he took your shame, he put it on the cross. Now your suffering is the simplicity of that your human mind can't handle what the Spirit has done. So quit trying to figure this thing out. The worst thing you can do is try to figure out Christianity. You can't. You can just get closer to him. You do that through time. You do that through prayer. You do that through love. You do that through the word. You get focused on what he's saying. And when you focus on what he's saying, what he's saying eventually gets in you. And as what he's saying gets in you, it eventually has to come out of you. And as it's coming out of you, what's around you begins to change because his word is radiant, according to what we just read, power. Now, you listen, we can't, we can't forget what we just read. Hebrews, Hebrew, Hebrews 1, let's, start, let's go back. Hebrews 1, verse 1. I can feel myself being pulled in teaching mode. So, <clears throat> Hebrews one verse one. He is at sole expression. This is the uh, uh, this is the amplified. Let's let's do it. Put it up. Put it up. In, put it up in New King James for me. I'm gonna read it off the screen. Hebrews one verse one. We locked up. There we go. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, I, I love the way that the King James is poetic. Passed unto the fathers by the prophets, which means that's how we were spoken to at that time. Next verse. Hath in the last day spoken to us by his son, who is, a pro- who is appointed heir of all things. So what we're doing, please, please hear me. Now, I'm going to say some things today that, that might bump up again. You know, when have I ever stopped saying stuff? That just... We still, especially in the Pentecostal world, we still like to get what the prophet thinks. We still chase the prophet. Now, the, but the pro, listen to me. Prophecy, anybody that's a real prophet will tell you this. Prophecy should just complement what the Lord has already put in you. It should not be a new instruction. And what we've done is we've chased somebody with a gift, and we start following what the gift says instead of listening to what Jesus is saying to us. And the Word says that in the past, that's how he spoke. He had to spoke. God, God was bound that because there was no blood between us but the minute blood got in between us at that point you started having an opportunity to go straight to him think about it everybody beats themselves up well and i i, I do too we all go through this well i i did this i said this i, I thought this and, and i put myself here and this is going on but yet the blood has given you a direct line to the creator of the universe you don't have to qualify Oh, please listen. You don't have to qualify for God to hear you. Crickets. He qualified. And his quality was bled out to put on you so you become his quality. We tend to think that there are these name brand Christians and then these great value Walmart Christians. That's not real. The blood is priceless. And when you're covered in the blood, it doesn't matter where you find yourself, that blood speaks. This is still your child. And because this is your child, God moves to where you're at if you just call on him. And what he wants is for you just to speak his word, his way. Now, what you've got to do is you've got to understand that Jesus is the image of God. Y'all do understand that, right? That Jesus was the walking, talking image of God. And I want you to understand something. If you don't hear anything I say today, hear this. Healing our image of God heals our image of ourselves. Now, this is going to get tight. Y'all already quiet this morning, so I'm just going to preach hard. Your image of God is how you act in your Christianity. If you think God's mean, you're mean to people. If you think God is holy and righteous and head and shoulders above everybody and never walks in love, then that's how you treat people under you. Your image of God is how you treat people in your Christianity. And as you begin to learn his word and you move into a place where you're receiving him the way he really is, your image of who you are begins to change because if he's that good and he sent Jesus to cover me, then I need to adjust. Not your behavior, your heart. 
And as you move to the place where your, your heart starts to see God as a good, good father, not a mean and nasty God that's ready to bug zap you. You ever been around them people that, that just, you know, when, when we first came into this thing, y'all know April's testimony. She told y'all about when she finally experienced the love of God for the first time before that happened. She went out in the yard and she was screaming at God because she had, she had, had a rough childhood and, and all, her story is her story. But she was screaming at God. Now, I'm a brand new Christian. You know what my reaction was? I left the yard. I went somewhere else because if God strikes her, he ain't getting me. <laughs> but that was my image of God. And all of these 20 some odd years later, my image of God has changed. And my image of myself has now changed. Because you, you, have you ever seen those haughty preachers? I'm going to tell you all this story. I probably shouldn't, but when's that ever stopped me? And I, some of you have heard this before. But when I, was, when I was first coming up in evangelism, I was an armor bearer in Birmingham for a big ministry. And I was learning to preach the gospel. I, I watched TBN all the time because that was kind of like my training ground. I could go to church every night. God knows I would have. I really would have gone to church every night if I was allowed to because I was a drug addict then I wasn't. Something's good. I got to be there. And so I saw this preacher and that's back when TBN would, would had, the, had the live crowds and you could go down and minister to them. This is years and years ago. And this guy is ministering and I know his name and you do too and I'm not going to say his name. And he's ministering to people and this lady comes up and you could tell that she is broken. You can tell. I mean, through a TV screen, you can tell that she is on her last leg, that she's on, she could commit suicide on the way home. That's how bad it was. Older lady, and she came up, and, and, and he said something. They put the mic up there, and he prophesied to her. And he said these words to her in such a vernacular that I could, and I'm an English lit guy, I couldn't even understand what he said. Much less this, this woman who was broke down, what, ha halfway listening. And then she says, I don't understand. And without tears just rolling down her face. And she says, I don't understand what that means. And he says these words, and this marked me, this moment marked me. He said, God speaks to the prophet on the intelligence level of the prophet. You're going to have to go figure it out. Your image of God is how you treat people. Now, this woman could have gone home and committed suicide. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. The love of Jesus was not shown. And she just stood right there. She didn't move. Tears fall down her face. And, and this minister, he, I, don't, I want to clarify. He didn't purposely hurt her. Okay, let me just be clear. I don't think he set out to do that. But I've learned over the years, when you flow in the gifts, the gifts flow by love. And it doesn't matter how flashy the service is. It matters how real the service is. And if people are walking out better, not just happy. See, a lot of people leave church happy. A lot of people leave church singing and dancing and shouting, but they don't know anything for when the battle gets hot. And when you, when you slow down like we slow down today and we teach, then people get bored. But this is the stuff you need when the battle gets hot. Because you have to know who he is. He sees you as valuable enough to send his son to shed blood and die for. Not just shed blood and die for, but to be beaten for. Not just to be beaten for, but to be beaten so severely that the only thing keeping him alive was the Holy Spirit. To be beaten so bad that your, your, your entrails are hanging out. You need to go do a Mayo, you can Google it, go Christ's Crucifixion Mayo Clinic. They broke down what happened to his body and there's no way a human could have lived through that. And yet he kept going through this for you. And then as a minister of the gospel, we want to stand up here head and shoulders and be haughty to the people who need that. Because our image of God is the image of who we are. And that's why we chase titles instead of Jesus. And we've got to move to the place that we're saying what he says, not what we says. Because what we say won't help anybody. But if you're saying what he says, then people can be changed. In, in the book of Hebrews, it says his radiance, the first chapter, his radiance, his glory. Everything moved to a place that we not, not only have the right, but the responsibility to say things like Jesus says them. There was bloodshed for this. So healing your image of God is healing uh, your image of this. Now listen, 
We become the image of God that we believe he is. You become that. If you believe God's angry, you're an angry Christian. I've been to churches. I told you all this last week. Uh, we don't go too deep into it. But when I first got saved, still had long hair. Looked like Seth. Praise the Lord. Good news, you're pretty. I could put my hair in my pocket. It was a little longer than his. And I'd just gotten saved, just gotten delivered from drug abuse and all this stuff. And I went to a church, and the deacon didn't like me having long hair. And the deacon said, I can't come in his church. You hear the words? His church looking like that. Now I just gave my life to Jesus. But that was his image of God. His image of God was live right, spit white. And if you're not living it like me, you must not be living it right. That is not how this thing works. The Bible says that you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean you have to be afraid of God. It means that you have to have full respect that God is remolding you. And you have to be willing to submit to something you don't know. And let him work on you. Let him touch you. Let him put you in a place and move you around and do something great with you. And it can happen. But it's all about the image of how you see things. And now, I want to say a couple more things. And then we're going we're gonna to move into some, I really, I'm jumping a lot of scriptures. But I really feel I'm pulled to deal with some things here. Listen to me. Religion shows you a God that will love you if you change. If. That's what religion says. Religion says, if you do this, if you act like that, oh man, look, when I first got saved, and it was in the early 90s, and I had ministers tell me that if you didn't wear, I literally had a preacher tell me, if you didn't wear a blue suit, a black suit, or a brown suit, you ain't a preacher. <laughs> Some people just prove that dumb's a real word. Because I fought, you got to understand, I played music my whole life, and I fought with that. I fought with, well, you, you can't be in my class if you got an earring. What's the earring got to do with my learning ability? That's how I thought. That's the world I came from. What's my long hair got to do with my Christianity? You know, then, then, then you become a debater. Then you, oh, well, Jesus had long hair. Well, how do you know? The picture says, well, you weren't there. The guy that, the guy that painted the picture never saw Jesus. So the thing is, we get caught up in the semantics when all we have to do is focus on him. And as we get closer to him, we realize that religion says if, if you do this, if you do that, if you change, if you, if you, if you do this, I love you. You ever been around that manipulative person in your life that if you do things exactly right, they love you for 20 minutes? That's not how this works. Relationship says I love you all the time, good, bad, or ugly. And that's what God's called us into. He's called us into that place where good, bad, or ugly, no matter where you find yourself. And we all find ourselves in places that sometimes we don't know how we got here, but we're here. And he loves you there. And he gave you a blood. And he gave you a word. And he gave you a Holy Spirit. And he gave you a, an open window of heaven. And he gave you communication to be able to do that. We talked last week about the phone. I was... I was I was watching the video from Easter about the, uh, the, the asking about the rotary phone. That was Tucker, by the way, just so y'all know. He's asking, how does that thing work? You know, you know, y'all don't, oh, y'all don't know nothing about that. But we had to know, and you supposed to, when I, I come from Grand Bay, and our, my phone number, my very first phone number, and my mom's, if she still had a house phone, would still be the same. It was one two zero five eight six five six nine three eight. That's a lot of numbers to do that with. <laughs> And, it just, and you got to wait on it to come back. And if you get in there a little too quick and it stops, it hangs up. you got to start all over. But once you're connected, everything was fine. But just like I said today, we have, we have smartphones and all we do is say the name. And this is the point. Through Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, all you have to do is say the name. Because he's ready, willing, and able to help you where you are. But you got to be willing to move to it. And we don't do that in church anymore. We just want to have a, we just want to have a party or a show, and the lights look right, and we want to grow like this church. And, and well, the, he's he's got on skinny jeans and glasses. I wear glasses, but you don't want me in skinny jeans. I look like a golf tee <laughs> with a ball on it. <laughs> you don't want that. I don't understand how we equate good ministry to what we see. It's what we encounter. 
We're missing who Jesus is by looking for things to look good. And that's not how it's supposed to be. God's called us to a place where, just like the woman at the well, he wants us to move to a place where we are excited to see him. See, people miss the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Because here's what happened. She was up there in a time of day when women weren't supposed to be there. And she was there in a time of day when women weren't supposed to be there because she was a woman that none of the other women liked because she was messing around with their husbands. And she'd been married all these times, and Jesus called her out on it. And he said, hey, you done messed around with this many. You've been divorced this time, and you're just shacking up with this one. And he never judged her. He just told her what was going on. And then loved her to the point that she went, listen now, think about this. He called her on her sin, told her how to be free from it, gave her so much love that she was so excited to run to a city and tell them about Jesus. If we taught Jesus correctly, no one would ever be afraid. If we flowed in the Holy Spirit the right way, people wouldn't be afraid. If we really knew who God was, then people would be flocking to you to hear more about him. Now, I'm not casting judgment because all of us have to grow. But the truth is, if our image of God is right, then we understand that Jesus is where we should be headed, not church. Y'all, if we really understood what Jesus did for us, if we really understood what the cross meant, if we really understood what the blood meant, praise and worship would be easy. Easy. But then there's days like today where you come in and you feel it the minute you get on the property and you know the enemy. We got people that got saved last week. So all of a sudden there's this fight in this church today where it's just hard to break through. But the feeling doesn't change who God is because I don't live by feelings. Trust me, if I live by my feelings, I quit multiple times. Let me just tell y'all, so I love all y'all, but if I lived on your shout, Lord Jesus, y'all the quietest church I've ever been in. Ever been? I tell people all the time when they come here to preach, I set them down, I'm like, look, they Pentecostal, they love Jesus, but don't expect them to go crazy with you. Just, 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 just teach. Just do your thing. And, and Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Tracy, I shouldn't tell y'all this, but I'm going to. Pastor Tracy Harris said he's got four or five uh, of the worst meetings he's ever had in his life. We're like number three. Because it was just tight that night. We had actually been under construction. And, I mean, miracles are flowing. Two or three people get healed. The rest of us just like, we just laid over tired. But the truth is, when you see Christ, when you see Jesus, when you focus on the image of God, then your eyes are on something other than your problems. See, we come to church, please hear me, we come to church and we create this scenario where I've got to get to the preacher, I've got to get to the altar, I've got to do this the, the church way to be able to get free, missing that you could have got free when the problem creeped up if you would have went to him, because, because Jesus was the image of God, his blood's on you. And if his blood's on you, then God has to look at his own image. Oh, I'm fixing to mess with y'all now. If you understand that the blood of the image of God is on you, then God has to respond to his own image. You ever walk by a mirror and just stop and go, hmm, or, or see something you need to fix, right? You walk by a mirror and you, you say, oh, man, I need to fix my jacket. My hair's sticking up. I need to trim this. I need to do that. Oh, man, I need, some, I need this. I need some. Somebody give me some paint. Got to fix the barn, whatever. That is how it is. Please hear me. This is how it is with God. God sees his image and he sees what needs to be fixed. And he starts talking to you about it. But you got to listen. You got to move to a place that you get past the pride of you can fix you. Because if you could fix you, we wouldn't need churches. We wouldn't need Jesus. If you could fix you, you would be over into a place to where people would follow you in flocks because you've got something none of us have. We don't have it. But when Jesus got all things, in Hebrews, when he got all things, please hear me now. Matter of fact, let's just read it again. I'm going to read it from the end. I got my notes all mixed up now. You got the NIV back there? No, that's a big thumbs down he just gave me. <clears throat> I'm not worried about it. I'm not reading it off this. What it said was, 
gave him all things in Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, that Jesus was given all things. Now listen, if you get nothing, get this. If Jesus was given all things and he died, then by covenant, all things went to who he left it to. And what are you covered in? You have all things, all power, all authority to walk in what Jesus promised. You have it. And what stops you is your mind. Because misery loves company. And when you go through something, you got to tell somebody or you got to post it or you got to you got to share it or you got to you got to make sure somebody's aware of your misery. Do you Can I just say this? Do you realize and I'm not I don't know, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but do you realize by sharing your misery with the world is anti what the world I mean what the Bible says? The Bible says to cast the whole of your care on him because he cared for you, 1 first, first Peter 5 and 7. Come to him with everything. Because when you put it out there, you're putting it into an atmosphere where demons now have charge. And they now have, it's almost like this. It's almost like if somebody really wanted to hurt you, and you called such and such and said, you know what would really hurt me is this. And they called the person that wanted to hurt you and gave them that information, then they came and did it or did whatever it took to break your heart. When you spend your time on the problem, you're giving demon entities everything they need to come do what it is that's bothering you. You know what? Can, let me just say this. I thought I was going to wrap up right there, but I don't guess I am. Listen, why is it that we will accept so readily the attack of the enemy, but we won't accept the blessing of Jesus, which is limitless power? The attack of the enemy is temporary, and he has a short attention span. Now, I'm going to say this. Again, this is going to bump up against some theology, but since we're in teaching mode today, I can do this. Satan sows what? What does he try to give to you all the time? Fear. So is Satan big enough to be taken away from what God says? No. No. So if Satan sows fear, and biblically speaking, what you sow comes back to you a hundred times, then you realize the one attacking you is more fearful than you are. But you think he's big and bad. He's scared. He's afraid. He's telling you your past. He's sowing strife. But yet he is always in turmoil himself because it has to come back to him. Are y'all with me? The Bible says that if you're sowing, that it has to return. If you're sowing, it has to return. Be careful what you say because it's going to come back to you. Be careful what you do because you're sowing seeds. Satan has to live by the same law. So if he's sowing to you hurt, then he's in more pain than you are. I heard a sermon one time. Years and years when I first got saved, I heard a sermon. Uh, uh, Gosh, what was that? April, what was that at Living Word? Floyd Lahan. Floyd Lahan, that's his name. Floyd Lahan. Floyd Lahan taught a sermon that was 10 reasons why I feel sorry for the devil. And by reason five, I felt sorry for him. Because it was this stuff. It was what he's sowing is coming back to him. What he's doing, although we've made him big and we've made his image big and we think that he's on the same level with God and he's not, we put him in such a bigger category and that's what he wants because he's so afraid. Most people that are insecure want to be puffed up. And on a spiritual level, that is exactly what Satan is. But God doesn't need that. He just needs you. Think about that. Get past your own insecurity and your pain and your hurt. And I, I know we all been done wrong. Y'all, I know it. But when you come to the realization that the creator of the universe needs you. Are you hearing me? He needs your voice. He needs your eyes. He needs your mouth. He needs your song. He needs your words. He doesn't need you to puff him up to be bigger God. He needs you to be him on this planet because they're children. I have children. I love all my children. And all of my children, if half of them were gone and I had no way to get to them, I would want somebody to go get them. And he needs you to go get his kids. And you get his kids by being like him, not worried about what the enemy's doing. 
because the enemy has no power. All things, all power, all authority was given to him. Everything was given to Jesus, and Jesus gave it to you on the cross. When you put him on, you put everything on that came with him. Stop doing his work with your words. Just go be like him. Just go be in the image of who he is. Just do what he's asking you to do. And watch him fix the rest. Years and years ago, years and years ago, I would hear preachers say, Alan, just don't worry about booking up. Don't worry about this. Don't. You know, because we're taught in ministry that, that you, you got to get your name out there. you got to network. you got to get everybody, give them your card, you know, get your card out there. you got to incorporate your ministry. you got to do this. And I had Matt Gober pull me to the side, and he said, Son, if you will worry about getting the word out, God will get everything else in. And that's, that's really all we need to focus on. Just get the word out. You've got word in you. You come to church here, you get the word every Sunday. You, uh, listen, you, you get very, very well taught here. Not, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying we just don't preach whipped cream sermons here. We challenge, we push. And we do that because there's a world that needs what's in you. And somebody's got to break the shell off of you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet and just worship for just a second.